Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. These last couple of weeks, we have seen nature at its fiercest, but also humanity at its best. And the truth is that storms are an inevitable component of human life. So you don't normally need to go out looking for storms, they find you. And sometimes it's one storm after another, as we've seen recently. So the question is not whether we will be able to avoid the storms. The question is, how are we going to handle the storms when they do occur in our life? So from our perspective, our human limited perspective, these hurricanes are a total disaster, an enormous loss of property, and worst of all, loss of life. But perhaps from God's perspective, these hurricanes are an opportunity for our, dem our nation to demonstrate the great hero heroic virtues of compassion and self-sacrifice and generosity. Perhaps these hurricanes are an opportunity for our nation to find a renewed desire to cherish, to cherish all human life, regardless of color and regardless of nationality, and to protect all life from conception to natural death. Perhaps these hurricanes are an opportunity for our nation to find unity and to find agreement. Now with that said, let's turn together to today's gospel that talks about unity and agreement. And it's got the gospel of Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 to 20. And in the second to the last sentence, I want to begin at the end of it, verse 19 to 20 says this. Again, I, a man I say to you, if two of you agree on earth, about anything for which you are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. In the time of Jesus, the rabbis used to have a saying, if two persons sit together and the words of the law are spoken between them, the Shekinah rests between them. Shekinah is a Hebrew word that means the visible glory of God's presence. Well, when Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. In other words, Jesus himself is assumes the place of God's divine Shekinah. This means that Christians, when we gather together in his name, Jesus is guaranteeing I'm there with you. But Jesus made a conditional statement in verse 19. He said, if two of you agree. So let's stop there for a moment. The word agree in the original Greek language is symphoneo. Sim means together with and phoneo means sound or voice. That's where we get the word symphony from. I love to hear the symphony, for example. A symphony is basically an agreement of sounds. In other words, Jesus is basically saying, if two of you are praying in symphony, in street lingo, this means if two of you are in tune, or if your prayer has got your, the rhythm, and if it reaches God's ear like a symphony in rhythm, then God loves that. Apparently, our Heavenly Father really likes it when His children pray to Him together in agreement in symphony. When's the last time that you prayed together with your family? outside of here, outside of the church? When's the last time you prayed together at work? You know, maybe some employees or friends, you know? Could it be that one reason we're not seeing more powerful results from our prayers is how little we pray together outside of just Sunday Mass? See, when Christians are gathered together in His name, Jesus is guaranteeing what? I'm there. It doesn't matter where it is. I'm there with you. For many people, that's sort of hard to understand because their concept of God is built around a God who's outside of everything. A God who's essentially somewhere else. A God who made the world, who made the universe, but then stands back and just sort of watches it from a distance. A God who's way over there somewhere else. But Jesus is telling us, no, I, I'm not just over there. I'm right here in your midst. Here, now. The question is, are we in agreement? Are we in rhythm with Him, with His love? But what do we do if someone has betrayed our love? What, what do you do if someone you love has sinned against you, has hurt you, 
and has made you feel disrespected or unloved? What do you do if someone you love is totally out of rhythm with God's love? Well, the most painful obligation of love is called fraternal correction. What's it called? Would you repeat that word with me? Fraternal correction is an important term I want you to learn. The question is, when are we obligated to correct someone in love? Now, there's five conditions that determine if you are under the obligation to correct someone. Number one is that the wrongdoing is obviously something really serious. Number two is that the person is unwilling to correct themselves. Number three is the correction must not directly harm that person. You can't like torture them or something. Number four is the correction must be done in charity, in love. And five is that the risk of correcting them cannot outweigh the benefits. In other words, if you think the person when you correct them is going to, you know, take out a gun and shoot you, then you're not obligated to correct them, okay? Yet listen carefully. The fear of offending someone or the fear of they're going to get angry or he might not be my friend anymore is not a legitimate excuse. Some people I, I, I see are too angry or too hurt or too afraid to even want to speak with a person who did that. In that case, this is what I pray, or you can pray something like this, Jesus, like right now I'm just too angry and too hurt. You, you, you're going to have to heal me enough, Lord, so that I can even allow such a process of reconciliation to begin with that person. For example, the dad of a friend of mine was an alcoholic. He's passed away now, but and she was afraid to confront him. Well, when she was a teenager, she finally built up the courage to confront her dad's drinking because nobody else was. And the decision to confront someone is never an easy one to make, but you got to do it. She did it. I remember that. Now, if the above five conditions are met, it must be done either by the person that was hurt or by a person who has knowledge of that event. We are oblig obligated by love to correct someone. Now, Jesus knew that we're going to mess up a lot. And so he provided us like a real simple process to bring fraternal correction upon someone that we really love. And that brings us to, back to the gospel. So there's a few steps in this that Jesus says. Step number one is bringing, how to bring, bringing fraternal correction is found in verse 15. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. The key word here is between you and him. What does it say? Alone. That commandment of our Lord Jesus is probably the most disobeyed commandment of all. Because sometimes we would rather talk about those people instead of talk to them. Or some people will say, well, that's none of my business. Instead, I'll just gossip about it to everybody else. No, I invite you to look, no, look around your circle of friends. Look around in your place of employment. Do you see a lot of gossiping? Do you see a lot of backbiting? Do you see a lot of insinuations taking place? Well, the next time a person comes up to you with one of these negative comments about someone else, just say, hey, look, don't talk to me, go talk to them. Okay, don't talk to me, go talk to them. Those seven little words can help you end gossip. So repeat after me, okay? Don't talk to me, talk to them. In other words, you and him alone talk it out don't bring it to me quite yet okay now if you're dealing for example with an alcoholic you might have to adapt adopt a professional intervention strategy and and, and you have to sort of wait for the right moment because you unless you do it uh, uh, because it's useless to do it like if they're drunk or something like that if someone is on a self-destructive path in their life or is doing something dangerous it's an inspir it's an important aspect of love to correct them so don't be afraid to correct them. That, don't be afraid that you might lose a friend or get criticized in return. We have to overcome our resistance to fraternal correction. So the step number one is go and tell them their fault between you and him. How? Alone. Now, 
if they listen to you and repent and ask forgiveness of their sins, that's awesome. You've gotten your brother and sister back into the rhythm of God's love that the first reading talks about today. But if you don't, if they don't listen to you, then our natural tendency is to want to bolt. That's it. I'm out of here. I call it quits. But God says, no, 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 no. Don't give up. Keep trying. Keep trying. Step two is in verse 16. It says, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That means that that we're su supposed to seek the wise counsel of others and begin organizing like a support network or uh, of relatives or close friends to talk to them with you. Sometimes you got to sort of prepare a little plan of action with, with a group of people. You know, if you're working, for example, with Alcoholics Anonymous, they can, they can help you to make arrangements for the person to enter a rehabilitation program. And you have to be firm and you have to be very clear, especially, for example, with an alcoholic or drug addict. You can't be wishy-washy and you can't be indirect yet because you, you can't enable their behavior anymore. That means you don't cover up for alcoholics inability to go to work or their inability to pay the bills that they should be paying. Now, if the person won't listen to others, then once again, our natural tendency is to want to bolt and sort of get out and quit. But God says, no, don't give up quite yet. Don't give up. Then comes up step three. Verse 17 says, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell the church. See, Jesus has given his church his own authority. They didn't come to talk to Father Dale and come to talk to me, you know. But you try, you can do it first on your own. Then comes after that step number four. The final one. Verse 17 says, If he or she refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Now Jesus loved the Gentiles and he loved the tax collectors. When a, but when a person refuses to listen to the church, then they have hardened their hearts. And they have fallen into what I would say a full-blown full self-righteousness. That means that there is no repentance in their heart. And they have to first come to a place of repentance and reform. Otherwise, it will probably just continue hurting themselves and hurting you and others. Now, does that mean that you can now bolt and leave them? Yes and no. Yes is that in this stage, God like, gives you permission to physically separate from that person. You know, some people with a victim mentality might want to not separate and just sort of... But sometimes you have to. For example... It might mean asking a grown son who keeps bringing drugs into the home to leave your home. It might mean that you stop calling them on the phone or it might mean that you have to get a restraining order for a husband that's threatening his wife. That means that you have to recognize the physical and spiritual harm that they are doing to you and your family. And sometimes you have to physically sever that relationship for a period of time. It does not mean that you do not love them. It does not mean that you give up on them. You never give up on them. You never give up on them. You never stop loving them. You just have to simply love them from afar. You have to love them from a distance. That means that you have to love them through prayer. And so today, let's pray for them. Let's not pray all, not only for the victims of the hurricane. Let's pray for all the people that you might know that are in situations that require fraternal correction. But remember, when we pray together, when we gather together for the purpose of prayer, Jesus guarantees us that he's here with us. He's here with us. May you gather with others to pray in agreement as a beautiful symphony to God, as humanity at its best. May you not be afraid to love even when that requires fraternal correction. And may you realize that God's Shekinah presence is in our midst right now. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia.